on behalf of the entertainment committee, I uh, would like to thank you all for coming. You know, we were first got some ideas about this event and then started putting things together and we were just never really sure how the thing was going to work out. Well, the uh, response has been overwhelming. A lot of interest and so it should be really interesting to hear the stories that uh, Jordan's going to tell us. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Alison O'Rourke and she'll introduce our guests. Thank you. Um, native Oregonian Jordan Schnitzer grew up in Portland attending Ainsworth Grade School and Catlin Gable High School. He is a graduate of um, the University of Oregon in 1973 and in 1976 he received his doctorate degree from Northwestern School of Law at Lewis and Clark College. Shortly thereafter Jordan began working full-time at his family's real estate company, Harsh Investment Properties, a Portland-based real estate acquisition, development, and management company started by his father and mother in 1950. He is now the president of the company with regional offices located in Seattle, Portland, San Francisco, Sacramento, Las Vegas, and San Diego, and oversees a portfolio of office, industrial, retail and multifamily properties. With a staff of over 200 professionals, Jordan has built Harsh into one of the largest privately held real estate property and management companies in the Western United States. In addition to his role as CEO of Harsh, Jordan has served on over 31 civic and cultural boards, including the Portland Art Museum, the Japanese Garden Society of Oregon, the High Desert Museum, the Citizens Crime Commission, and the Friends of Astoria, to name a few, Astoria Column, to name a few. Following his um, family's commitment to support art and culture, Jordan has created one of the nation's largest contemporary print collections, which is shared with the public. He and his family foundation have funded and organized over 90 exhibitions of work from his collection, which has traveled to over 60 museums including exhibitions at the Portland Art Museum, the Bellevue Art Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Legion of Honor Museum in San Francisco, and the Detroit Institute of Art, and many others. Jordan has received many honors and awards, including Portland State University President's Award for Outstanding Philanthropy, State of Oregon Governor's Arts Award, Volunteer of America's Oregon de Priest Award, for excellence, Catlin Gable Distinguished Alumni Award, and in addition, the University of Oregon Presidential Medal and the International Print um, Center in New York Award of Excellence for the, his touring art program. He is also very proud of the renovation at the Art Museum at the University of Oregon, which was renamed in his honor. Jordan lives in Portland with his family and has been a member of the Portland Golf Club since 1987. Please welcome Jordan Schnitzer. Should I turn, this, should I turn that off or do you want it? I don't know. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first, can, can you all hear me? Can you hear me without the mic? And that's maybe do it without the mic, and it's a little, little easier. Um, first, uh, Alyssa, thank you so much. I first met uh, Alyssa and Michael when they, uh, Michael had gone to Williams with a friend, uh, Greg Peterson, who married Punch and Joan Green's daughter, Carter, who I'd gone to school with and grown up with, and so we've known them for decades, and it's so nice. Uh, I think I'm going to cut that bio in short next time. It gets so embarrassing. <laughs> But this is like coming home because uh, this has been a home and so many of you have been like extended family to us and it's nice of you to come out on such a nice day. Uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, gratifying that you all may have some interest in, uh, in part of what I have to say. Uh, it's also been exciting when uh, a couple of years ago, over the years, we've all talked at Portland Golf Club about, you know, we're modeling the uh, facility and I got some calls and recommended uh, some people to use and I think the, uh, the job came out just incredibly well and I'm just so proud of all the effort and that we realized we needed to step up because, you know, these clubs 
all involve discretionary time and discretionary dollars. And it's a different world today than it was some years ago. Unless you keep these things up and fresh and give people a reason to be part of them, then they don't survive. And this is such an honored and important part of the community. It's wonderful to see what we've done. Then when I got a call, did I have any art that I might be willing to loan for a little while? That just warmed my heart because as you'll hear from this presentation, uh, not only do I feel so lucky to have the passion about having art in my life, but even more so about sharing it. So this is a journey back in time. And there were a few of you here I spoke on Wednesday night at the town club. So actually, Jenny and let's see, Diane, why don't you come on up? Because in the eighth grade, Manville, Schauffler, Catlin said about, uh, about reports is first you tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. So since you heard part of this, you come on up and I'll sit down and see how much you heard. <laughs> OK, all right. So with that, uh, Dal, if we can, uh, OK. Next, please. All right. Uh, why art? What is art? Why do we need it? How do we make it fun? How do we get art into our lives? All in 30 minutes and then some questions. And we're also lucky today that I've asked some artists to be here. And uh, Mary Josephson and her husband, Gregory Grennan. Mary's, over, Mary's back there. One of Mary's works is here. Gregory Grennan's is over there on the right. And then uh, Sherry Wolf, who has two works in the, this room, uh, is with us. And I'm going to ask them to maybe come up and, and answer a few questions and talk about why they like being in Portland and what art, what art means to them. OK. Next, please. How did my art journey begin? Well, I'm especially happy that my mother, Arlene, is here because uh, uh, not only did she and my father join Portland Golf Club and then suggested that I should, and in essence, uh, the pants I'm wearing today come from Estes. And it was, uh, <laughs> and it was Esty Morrison who sponsored me. And I'd gone to school with all the Morrison kids, and I'll never forget how enthusiastic he was and how nice he was to sponsor me and, and, uh, and uh, get me into the club some years ago. But uh, how'd the journey begin? OK, next. Here I am at age two. OK, next. <laughs> Age five, I went to Ainsworth grade school, and in, you know, in first grade, you know, remember date for some of you parents, Davy Crockett uh, was really popular. Okay, so what happens then is this is my mother and me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, you know when you're a speaker, it's good to stop when everybody's moving on. So good, it's gorgeous out. Let's go have the appetizers. <laughs> Okay, all right, next. Okay, so I go to first grade at Ainsworth Grade School. My mother has some time on her hands and wants to do something. So she looks around for a program that is from nine till noon, and lo and behold, down the street, because we grew up on 16th and Myrtle, uh, lo and behold was the Portland Art Museum. This was its original uh, building, and next please, by the time, one, go back one. By the time she enrolled, uh, the, the Belushi building that we all know so well, and she enrolled in the Portland Art Museum Art School when I was in the first grade. Next, please. So some of the major teachers at the school were Mike Rousseau, Louis Bunce. They were leaders of the art community. And like most artists in most communities, they needed to teach to make a living. Now, they complained to her that besides the rental sales gallery, that still is doing a wonderful job renting work like some of the work that's at Portland Golf Club right now, but there was no contemporary art gallery in Portland. So they convinced her to open up a art gallery. So she, no, there's one more of Mike. There's Mike Rousseau, uh, Louis Bunce. So go back one. Okay, so she and my grandmother, Helen Director, and another lady for a couple of years, Edna Brigham, opened up the Fountain Gallery of Art. So named because the cheapest real estate in town for 50 bucks a month was at the New Market Theater building on the corner, and it was kitty corner from the Skidmore Fountain. So they named it the Fountain Gallery of Art. And um, the uh, first opening, next. Next, please. And here were the artists that were in the exhibition in 1961, and that began this magical journey for me. I remember going down and, uh, well, first, I remember when she went to art school, she started bringing in you know, canvases and charcoal and pastels and oil paints. And I started going over and playing with some like Microsoft's kids and others. And it was fabulous when she was getting ready to open the gallery. I remember going down, and uh, she and the other artists were painting the walls and sheetrocking and getting it all ready. And I remember there was this big drawer with all these little 
shell, the, 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 this big box with all these little shelves. And I remember pulling it open and looking inside, and I saw, next please. Oh, I, oh no, that, that, that one comes later. So, uh, <laughs> But I opened it up, and I saw a print that I'll show in a few minutes. But in the meantime, I put this in uh, be, with, the, uh, with the apology that my mother's going to kill me, and the ladies the other night uh, did get a chuckle. So uh, just remember, you all have pictures at home like this, too. So, okay. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so here she is uh, with the glasses and my grandmother on the left and Edna Brigham, but that was 1961. Next, here they are again in 1961, the first opening with a micro next. Here's uh, 1963, new hair color and new hairdo. Okay. <laughs> uh, next, please. Here we are, 1964, she moved to 4th Street. Okay, next, please. Uh, here's an opening if you... Uh, here I was, and I was a 13, and uh, of course, all the people smoking. Seems amazing now that people smoked as much as they did. Next, please. Here she is again in 68. You're still, you're, you're still as beautiful today as you were then. <laughs> okay. Next, please. Here's my father and grandfather, Simon Director, and that was in 1971. And there I am. Next, please. Here she is, uh, she moved to 21st in West Burnside where Laura Rousseau's gallery is now, to that space. And this was a picture with um, uh, her sister June, her older sister and my mother. And that was, uh, that was about 1970, uh, when did you move into the 21st West Burnside, 73, uh, 4? After the fire, fire downtown, so it would have to be uh, about 77. 77, okay. Next please. And uh, so after 25 years of operating the gallery, she decided that she wanted to really you know, retire from running a gallery. You know, I grew up with a working... She wanted to play more golf. She wanted to play, I was going to get to that, play more golf, spend more time with my father. And, you know, I grew up with a working mother. I mean, she'd fly out of the house at like uh, 9 in the morning, and, you know, Dad would drive me up to Ainsworth for the three minutes so he could spend a little time, you know, talking to me before I uh, went to school. And, um, uh, and so she decided after 25 years to... Uh, to do more philanthropic things, and she started golfing a lot. And you know, one thing that I uh, was so pleased about, uh, let's see, Kenny and Sarah, you're here, aren't you? There you are. Uh, well, I thought about this piece. You know, um, uh, Portland Golf Club played a really important part, I think, in my mother and my parents' life. Because like all of us, and I've grown up here, George and I went to grade school together, uh, known each other forever, but you know in life, as you get busy in your job and busy with your kids and family and whatever, it seems that your life gets narrower and narrower in terms of time for friends and so forth. And I think what was wonderful about joining Portland Golf Club is, uh, is my mother and father met a whole bunch of new people. And or people they might have known or whatever, but it sort of expanded their, their friendships. And I mean, with so many of you. And uh, we won't go into the little group you all formed called the C Cups. <laughs> and the uh, golf outings you took to Gearhart and other places and so forth. But I think it just uh, really talks about um, how wonderful institutions are and why they can be such, such a, uh, I think, very uh, constructive, healthy, uh, integral parts of our, of our lives in terms of a community of friends. Anyway, she retired and closed the gallery. And this was a fascinating time for me because I'd grown up with a mother that um, uh, worked in a gallery. And it added so much to our life. She started bringing art home. Our house was filled with art. I was at hundreds of openings. And I learned from her, as many of you did, and others in the community, the importance of first surrounding ourselves with art okay, and what it does to us, how it enriches our lives. And second, the importance of buying local art and supporting our local artists so they can stay in our communities. And that applies to music, dance, other, other cultural forms too. But in our cases, we supported all those other art forms too, but especially the visual arts. And it was, um, uh, looking back, um, a wonderful, wonderful time. I was blessed that my father started our real estate business. I started working when I was 14. I was a janitor. I'd go to Lincoln High School in the morning for summer school in the summer because I wasn't such a good French student. And I'd walk up, walk up to King Tower Apartments, and uh, I was a janitor. And I'd vacuum 14 floors and, and uh, 
Actually, the next year I decided I didn't like being a janitor, so I was a painter, and uh, that was interesting for a summer. And the following year, I had a friend who went to Beaverton, his name was Hal Ryder, and he had a job at Myron Frank selling women's shoes. And uh, you got paid commission, and you got to meet all these girls. I thought that was pretty good, and I went home and said, I'm going to apply to Myron Frank to go sell women's shoes. And my mother said, Harold? I think, he, uh, I think he better start working in the office. So as I said the other night, I don't know that it was retail's loss, but hopefully it was uh, the right decision for me. But anyway, uh, um, it was uh, wonderful to be surrounded by art and have it be such a part of my life. Next, please. Now, this is a piece I was referring to earlier when they were working on fixing up that space down, on, uh, down in the uh, New Market Theater building. Uh, when I pulled out this drawer, I saw this beautiful fuchsia-like, finger painting-like kind of art, and I was staring at it, and my mother came over and was looking over my shoulder, and she said, do you like that? And I said, yes. And she said, would you like it? I said, I'd love it. So she bought that for me, and lo and behold, it was a print, something that now has become such a big part of my life, works on paper. And this was by an artist named Stanley Hayter. Little did I know then that he was one of the most important artists uh, and uh, printmakers in the world. And uh, it was the first piece. Next, please. The second piece of art that I actually got was from my mother. This is by an artist named James Lee Martin, and it's called uh, A Crying Bird. Next piece. Uh, the first piece of art that I bought was this little study. It's about this big by Louis Bunce. And it says on the back, bought on the night of June 23rd, 1965, the first piece of the Schnitzer collection. And uh, I paid $5 a month for 12 months. And as I suggested, I think if I missed a payment, my mother knew where to foreclose. Uh, <laughs> and I've had this with me ever since. And it's in my little dressing room right now, right on the counter, on the, on the wall. So I see it every day and uh, still treasure it. Next, please. So she closed the gallery after 25 years. And I felt, as I suggested a few minutes ago, a very strong commitment to support art of our region. At the same time, I was feeling in hindsight, uh, being an only child, um, almost with the gallery being closed like a sibling rival dynamic there. I mean, there was a loss for me of not having that gallery still in my life. I was on the board of the Portland Art Museum at the time, and I came up from a meeting, a board meeting, and there was an exhibition curated by the late Gordon Gilkey. Uh, did any of you see that Monuments Men movie that came out a few months ago? Well, Gordon Gilkey was one of those monuments men. And uh, then he came back from the war and he started teaching at Oregon State. And he later became head of the art department at Oregon State and a really nationally known uh, art person. And he'd go off every once in a while to Belgium or France and come back with another lapel award for the wonderful things he did of helping uh, get the Nazi art and get it back to the rightful homes and so forth. Well, he was a printmaker and a print collector. So when I was on the board of the Portland Art Museum, we voted to accept his 20,000 prints mm -hmm. and to create the Gilkey Print Center and a curatorial position for him. So he had curated an exhibition of prints with a man named Bob Cox of the Ogden Gallery. So I remember coming up from this board meeting and going in that gallery on the first floor of the museum and seeing these wonderful contemporary prints of the, what I call, New York scene artists, you know, Hockney and Lichtenstein and Warhol and all those, those names. And I thought, you know, I want to keep committed to buying art of our region, but this might be fun to sort of maybe buy a few prints. And I had bought uh, some Ed Ruscha bubbles and I'd bought a small Wesselman, but otherwise over the years, everything I bought had been local artists. So I went down to the Ogden Gallery and saw Bob Cox that I knew. And when I was there, I saw some wonderful works on paper, and I bought a small Frank Stella, a little triangle piece, purple triangle piece. And I bought a Hockney from the Blue Guitar series, a series of 16 prints he did. And this particular one was a, like a Picasso-like head in it. And I bought a Jim Dine called a Heart Cross and a, and a um, skull, and just wonderful. And while I was there, I saw a few more. So I went back the next week, and I bought a few more, and then a few more. Now, if you're wondering where the art went, you've got to remember that I had a mother as an art dealer. So I heard her say to people all the time, if Michael and Lissa had come in and they loved something, but they said, we don't have any wall space, she would have said, geez, if you love the work, don't pass up on it. 
put it under your bed, rotate it, but don't pass up buying something that, that speaks to you just because you don't have wall space. So I'd blown through wall space before I'd finished college, so wall space wasn't the issue. So I started buying a few prints and a few prints and a few prints. And I had a small binder, a black binder, and I'd cut out an image of the work and I'd paste it in and I'd write down who the artist was and what I paid and so forth. And I say that because it's nothing like the sophisticated art systems data software we have now for the 8,000 prints we have that I don't know how to operate. Uh, but um, I had collected about 300 prints and I was on the board at the University of Oregon Art Museum. And the then director, David Robertson, came and asked if he could borrow some prints for an exhibition. And I said, certainly. So he picked from my binder and then went in the storage area and picked out the works. And three months later, I went down to Eugene to the University of Oregon Art Museum, on whose board I'd been for a number of years. And um, it was so exciting walking in and seeing these works arranged by the then curator, Larry Fong. Chris, do you remember Larry Fong? Do you remember him at all? He was a wonderful, wonderful curator. He retired about uh, 18 months ago. And it was a really special feeling. And what I felt was like walking into a room of friends, even though I didn't know any of those artists. But what hit me was, because it was different seeing work from my collection on those walls, uh, it was like walking into a room of friends and feeling comfortable, but being fascinated by the way Larry had curated the work, where he put each work. And I thought, this just doesn't get any better. And then the real turning point came when there was a, uh, the people started coming in and they started looking at the work and smiling and gawking and frowning and doing all those things that people do when they see art. It reacts. But then especially a man came in, there were some kids coming in too with their parents, but there was a man in front of a work by Robert Longo. Now Robert Longo did a series called Men in the Cities. And what he wanted to do was show people in sort of extreme physical positions. So if I asked any of you to stand up right now and sort of act silly and funny, it'd be really contrived, wouldn't it? But what he did is he got people in a room like this, his models, and dressed them in black and white, and he got a tennis ball machine. And he turned the tennis ball machine at them. So what happens to all these people is they're all sitting there trying to duck and move and move so they're not hit by tennis balls. Very, very clever. Because again, if we asked you to stand up and move around, it'd be so fun, strange. Okay, so there, and then he took photographs of all these people. So there's a big black and white print, uh, uh, and um, it's a man, and he's sort of like this. Okay. So I scooted down next to this eight-year-old son of this man that's looking at the, the art with his son. And I said to the young man, I said, gee, do you think that guy is dancing and rocking out or is he twisting in pain and about to collapse? Because in Robert Longo's work, that's what I see. Think about the last time you stubbed your toe and you're in agony, oh my God, you're consumed. You're consumed with the, everything else is blocked out. You're totally consumed with the agony of that toe being, oh God, right? Or think about that time when uh, one of your kids or your grandkids or you've just hit a, a fabulous drive okay and and it's a beautiful day like this the trees the sky everything is perfect and you're just uh, just consciously consumed with how perfect that moment is complete contentment well I think those lines for me when I see Robert Longo's work are so close to each other they're completely different kinds of emotions but they have that same result where you are consumed by feeling good things or pain. Anyway, that's what I see in those works. So I said to this young man, gee, what do you think is going on? He looks at it, and like any of your kids or grandkids, you could hear those wheels turning, and he said, I think he's dancing. To which I said, I think you're right. Because whatever he would have said, I would have said, I think you're right. Because that's what really sums up back to the why art. It's because not only for kids, but for all of us. We need a place to go where we're not being told by everything that we're getting bombarded with with our smartphones. We're not being told what to think, what to wear, what to listen to, what to eat. Art is one of the last refuges when each of you look at that fabulous Sherry Wolf or the Gregory Grennan or the work I'm gonna talk about in a second. Your mind can go off and think whatever you want. And if you think about technically what's happening, Okay. I mean, each one of you in this room, you all had parents, didn't you? 
Okay. Now, most of you have siblings, don't you? Okay. I mean, most of you hear golf, right? Okay. I mean, there are lots of things you have in common, but we're each made up of millions of different little parts of our lives, aren't we? We're all unique individuals. We're the summation of everything we've been. So think about when each of you look at the same artwork, you're bringing to looking at this Andy Warhol loaded with everything that's ever happened in your life. Your parents, your sisters, your school, your husband, your kids, your work, your everything. So it's logical that each of us sees different things in art because we're bringing to it okay, a million different pieces of a puzzle of our life. And that's what makes art so exciting and so wonderful. So we had this exhibition, okay, and when I finished talking to that young man, the light went off in me and said, you know, growing up in Portland, we weren't exposed to, it was Jim back there from Manhattan, right? You, from, Joe. Joe, 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 okay. When you were growing up, did you go to museums and did you? Uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. So when you grow up in some of the eastern seaboards and some of the bigger cities, there tends to be a pattern where for sort of a similar economic group, I'm not suggesting the New York there must be millions of people who haven't been to the Modern Museum or the Met or whatever. But it's a more frequent pattern in a lot of those urban areas than there is in many cities in the West. We're so blessed here with a wonderful relationship with nature and the outdoors that oftentimes going to a place where there's neat stuff like an art museum is a more foreign experience. It's somehow, you know, some elitist thing for somebody else. So what I thought about is, since I love buying art and this particular medium of works on paper is accessible and I could buy a lot of particular artists, wouldn't it be nice to create a preeminent private contemporary collection of prints and multiples and make them available to university and regional museums with the assumption that the big, instant, big museums have enough of their own, although I've since had shows at lots of bigger museums too. So it was that moment with that young man that was the turning point that led me to this very active program now where we've had 90 exhibitions at 60 museums and I have four exhibitions traveling at any one time. We do that all for free so they pick the a director or curator will come in they'll pick whatever they want there's no editorial control and then we um, say that's great and then we uh, ship it to them and then we do brochures and I have a brochure of the latest exhibition that opened two weeks ago in Omaha for you all and uh, um, and then we give them a chance to apply for some funding for outreach to bring in school kids or Native American kids or seniors or have symposiums or artists in residence. I have four people work full time on this now and so it's a big part of the, the civic and philanthropic work and, and it lets me get to a whole bunch of cities that I otherwise wouldn't probably go to. I mean, you wouldn't sit there and say, hey, honey, let's go to Wichita for a weekend. <laughs> nice, nice city. <laughs> Anyone here from Wichita? <laughs> it's a wonder. I loved it. <laughs> I want to go back. <laughs> and we are. <laughs> anyway, so next slide, please. Okay, so this is a list, and in this little uh, uh, thing about the uh, In Living Color, Warhol in Living Color, there's a description of the program and all the places we've had exhibitions. And if any of you want to get on the email blast that comes out about once a quarter as to where the exhibitions are, uh, you may be in some city or you know, know somebody there and say, hey, go see the work. Okay, next please. Okay, uh, this is a show called Under Pressure. And let's talk about how that actually, uh, how that actually happened. Now, listen, I go, how long do I go for to win? Oh, we're, we're, we're okay? You're okay? Okay. So the way this worked, for instance, is uh, I was at the Arlington Club having lunch about three years ago and I saw our wonderful director, Brian Fariseo of the Portland Art Museum. And he was having lunch with a young man. I went over to say hello to Brian. He said, I think you should meet this young man, Toby Jurevix. I said, hello, Toby. I said, oh, what do you do? He says, I'm the curator of the Jocelyn Art Museum in Omaha, which I had not heard of before. And it doesn't mean anything. There are lots of you know, museums. Um, and Brian said, you know, Jordan has this big traveling print exhibition, and you should go see what he does. So he came over and went through some of our books. We have the database, but we also have all these books that has all the art in it so curators can flip through them and sort of see them. And he said, so is this really true? We could pick whatever we want? Yes. And it's free? Yes. And we, uh, you'll ship it to us? Yes. And you'll give us some outreach money? Yes. He says, I think my director, Jack Becker, would like to talk to you. <laughs> so the next week, Jack Becker called, and he came out a couple weeks later. And he spent two or three days in the conference room going through these books, and he picked out about 130 works by 
Jasper Johns and Warhol and Lichtenstein and Donald Judd and Frankenthaler and Enrique Chigoy and on and on and on. But what was remarkable, remarkable from my standpoint is he also picked two of our Native American Northwest artists, Joe Federson, whose work is here, and Rick Bartow, who's a fabulous, amazing artist, and then, um, and then, um, uh, uh, and then a, a Seattle artist. Well, he's actually grew up in Seattle, but he lives in Kansas City. Roger Shiamora, who I love his work. Uh, Roger Shiamora's family was interned in Minidoka in Idaho at the beginning of World War II, and his work is very autobiographical. He went in the Marines, and I mean, just amazing, amazing work. So I thought it was interesting that Jack Becker picked in top of all these big national guys three artists that mean a lot to me. So uh, the way this works then is I said to him, well, this is great, that's fine, and as long as it's going back to Omaha, you must know museum directors in the Midwest, because I don't, why don't you see if there's some other people you know that might want the exhibition too? So he called up a few weeks later, and he said, gee, I've talked to some other museums, the museum in Wichita would like it, Salt Lake, I had a show there, I said, that's great. Missoula, Montana, I'd had a show in Bozeman, but not Missoula, and it, this show actually now is at the Bellevue Art Museum. Now this exhibition is at Missoula. Now the director of the Missoula Museum is a woman named Laura Millen. She'd been in Seattle for a number of years, although I had not known her up there, but she came down a year ago, November, because the show opened in February of 2014, and she came to talk, and uh, so I said, you know, do you have an outreach program? And she said, we have a wonderful program. We bring in all of the fifth graders, and our docents take them through our exhibitions. I said, that's great. I said, how many students is that? She said, 1,200. I said, that's wonderful. I said, but what about the other grades? She says, we don't have enough money to bring in those kids. I said, you figure out all the buses you need, and we'll write you a check so you can bring in all the grade school students that your docents can handle. And then I said, now, who else is around you? A particular senior group, she says, well, we have an Indian reservation nearby. I said, that's great. I love the Indian reservations. We work a lot with them. I said, which one is it? And she said, the Salish and Kootenai. I said, do they have grade school? She said, yes. I said, do you know the tribal leaders? She said, yes. So she um, um, went and talked to the tribal leaders, and they were delighted to um, uh, have their kids come. And then I said to Laura, look, as long as we're having the Native American kids come, and since Jack Becker had already picked and you're showing Rick Bartow, who you know, and Joe Federson, I've got more of their stuff. Let me send some more of their stuff over. And on top of that, why don't we see if Joe Federson can come over as an artist in residence? So we funded Joe Federson to come on over. And then I went to my mother and I said, gee, Mom, <laughs> how about a little bit of money for the uh, tribal kids to come on over? And she said, you bet. So out of the Harold and Lean Care Foundation, we funded that part of it. So what was wonderful here, and this sort of sums up the passion I have, is I love getting this work of all these major artists, okay, and our local artists, to these less served communities. And on top of that, to imagine the Native American kids that I'm sure have never seen Warhols and Jasper Johns and Ellsworth Kellys, but then see, in essence, one of their own, a Native, Native American artist in the show, and then have Joe Federson there as an artist. Just think about, we don't track it, but think about the possibilities and just think about in your lives. Go back in terms of what helped make you into what you are today that conversation you had, or following a parent, or seeing something, or going somewhere, traveling somewhere. Look at how circumstance can change our whole lives. So in terms of trying to change the world a little bit, uh, we just get such a pleasure out of reaching out to these audiences. And that's how that program worked. Next, please. Okay, this was a show about Andy Warhol. I want to talk about Andy Warhol a little bit, and then have um, Sherry Wolf and Mary and Gregory maybe come on up and talk a little bit. Um, next, please. Okay. Now, let's shift and talk about artists for a second. And, uh, you know, anyone can be an artist. When I finish up here real quick and we go on in to eat and you grab a cocktail napkin and you take a pencil and you scribble on it, you're an artist. Okay, that's, okay. everyone's an artist. Okay. To move on up, 
to be in the kind of walls of the art museums and get critical acclaim, you got to move on up. Look, in the same way we talk about golfers, right? Every one of you here is a golfer, right? Okay. But most of you here aren't on those tours, are you? <laughs> okay. So, you know, I mean, you know, different people were in the right place at the right time, you know, happen to have more talent. I mean, there are lots of reasons why certain people rise to certain levels. But that doesn't mean the joy you get from a, from a going out today. Uh, Wanda, I mean, you know, how much did you enjoy your golf game today? Pretty good. Okay. Okay. Maybe as much as Tiger Woods did. Maybe that's the wrong example to use this month. Okay. Okay. What I'm getting at is we each have the capacity for, for feeling good about things. Okay. So any of you can be an artist. But to be at this level, you got to do a couple things. First of all, you've got to have a passion inside you about some ideas that you're just dying to get out. Second, you've got to do it in a way that's different. Because if you're doing it in a way that's already been done, then that's not new. Okay, we already had a Renoir, a Matisse, a Picasso, a whomever. Think about it in this way if we put it in the context of uh, books. Okay, and this is a new one for you that heard the talk the other night. So let's say that, uh, let's say that uh, uh, you came to me and you said, gee, Jordan, I want to write the next great American novel. Great. great. Let's say, Christy, we were in, uh, in American Novel at University of Oregon together. So let's say you said that Clark Griffith class turned you on so much that you want to write the next great American novel. And you said, Jordan, would you, would you read my draft when I'm done? I said, sure. And three months later, you come back and you say, here it is. And I go off and read it. And we meet a week or two later. And she says, what do you think? What do you think? And I said, well, it's, it's really interesting. It's a good read. But you know, it sounds an awful lot like Ernest Hemingway, the cadences of the sentences and your themes. She says, that's right. Because I went on the web and I, I looked up who the, the most consistent selling writer has been the last 50 years. And Hemingway sells every year, so I just sort of emulated his style. And I said, well, you know what? That Harry's Bar has a Hemingway competition, and you should enter it because you're going to win that 50,000 bucks. Okay? Better than design work, huh? Okay? But if you want to write that next great American novel, then you've got to have a different style, a different theme, and be your own writer. So if you think about artists, it is plenty tough because there's a whole history of artists behind you. So they've got to have a burning passion to get some ideas out, and they've got to do it in a different way. So when you think about artists, the first thing I do, and let's talk about Andy Warhol, born in the late 20s, he, uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, he goes to what now is Carnegie uh, Mellon Institute, uh, uh, and um, he um, wants to be an artist. Uh, ma family name was Warhola. His mother says, hey, Andy, Tough to make a living as an artist. Why don't you try being a graphic artist? Okay, he gets a degree in graphic arts. Day after he graduates from Ohio, he makes a beeline to New York, and he became the most important graphic artist in New York, doing a number of uh, ads and commercial ads for different shoe companies. He did the windows for Bloomingdale's, and he started doing quite well financially. So he was living well. His mother packs up, ends up on his doorstep with her bag, lives with him the rest of her life. Okay. But he wanted to be a fine artist, and that's eating him up. Now, if you think about Andy Warhol and those pop artists, okay, they came generally post-World War II. He came to New York in 1952. Okay. Now, if you look at the people, let's say you were a young artist, and they're looking at who the big artists were then, well, they were the abstract expressionists, the people that were 10, 15 years older than they were, the Rothko. Okay, the Jackson Pollock, those were the people that were getting the, getting the publicity, pushing the envelope. They weren't necessarily popular, they weren't selling then, but they were the artists that the younger artists were looking at because they were the real thing. Now, the abstract expressionists, if you look at when they were, I mean, the, the, it was the, the, the modern artists of Mondrian, the people came before them. So you have to always think about this in terms of those sequences of who was influencing who. Now, if you think about artists in general, Artists from time immemorial have been the chroniclers of our time. And if there's one sound bite that you, you leave today with, it's this thing about chroniclers of our time. They are always the ones talking about visually the political themes, the social mores, the issues of our times. 
Okay? That's their role. That's their job. So with those two pieces in place, think about 1960, the, the, coming to New York in 1950. What's the biggest theme? Well, it's post-World War II America, right? Cars, Levittown, expansions of communities. But in terms of something that from a social standpoint affected us more than anything was TV. While there had been movies in the early part of the century, when TV came and you suddenly could see a show across the country, what blossomed up was the whole Madison Avenue and advertising. Right, Michael O'Rourke? So that's what was new to society, being bombarded by those Clairol ads as to how to wear your hair, to drive the Chevrolet, all those things. So all those pop artists were dealing with the themes that were hitting society then. That's why they were all talking about the individual and how do you maintain your individuality and your sense of identity at a time when you're being bombarded by advertising something that had never happened before to the degree that it was. So let me finish up with some ideas about Andy Warhol and these soup cans, okay? So here artists are trying to do something different. They're chroniclers of our time and they've got to, got to have a message, a burning message that wants to get out that they're willing to bear their soul and put it on canvas, put it in sculpture, put it in prints, and put it up there for all of you to look at. Okay? Pretty gutsy thing. So in Andy Warhol's case, he liked iconic themes. Themes in a various segment of society, business, culture, and he'd pick that theme and sort of hit that really hard. Okay? He did the Maryland's, talking about the whole movie industry. He did the Mao's, the most important then political figure in the world. Hard to remember then. Okay, one theme after another. Now why soup cans? So if we talk about soup, and this sort of surprised you guys at the town club, right? Okay. So in terms of soup cans, okay, if we think about food, okay, Campbell's soup was the first and one of only three products that have been made consistently since it first came out. But when this was brought out, Mr. Campbell was just dried, dried it and people laughed at him and said, no one's ever going to buy soup because everybody makes soup. So why are they going to buy a product that, you, that, you know, that they can make at home? Well, he was way ahead of his time. And he thought, gee, if people could buy soup and open it up and heat it up and feed a nutritional meal to their family, that might be a product that worked. Okay? Now, if we think about food and why Andy Warhol picked soup, Think about one food type that is the most universal of any kind of food type. It's not rice. You can't grow rice every place in the world. The one food type that you have everywhere in the world since cave people and stones and sticks was soup, right? As soon as they figured out fire, they could heat water and make soup. So it's the most universal food product there was. But think about the second theme. Who makes soup? Time memorial. Who made soup? Who? Mom. That's right, mom. So suddenly, for the first time, there was a commercial product that a mom could go buy and at 5 o'clock open it up and put it on the stove and heat it and feed her family instead of being there for four hours making soup. As I suggested the other night, this is the beginning of women's liberation. Okay? <laughs> this is a huge theme. Huge theme. Now, a second part of this also is Andy Warhol being a graphic artist. He was trying to also tell us because he was big into a theme called the democratization of art. He was also trying to say, look guys, art is all around us. It's not just in museums. Next time you're in that grocery store, look at the products, look around you. So what I guess what I'm suggesting when we finish up here is that when you think about art, think about those themes. They're chroniclers of our time. They've got a message. And what is that message? And let your mind drift off and just ponder with all those thoughts any of you may have. It's just fascinating. Now with that, what I want to do is very quickly have um, Mary Josephson and Gregory come up. Why don't you come up for a second here? And Gregory, why don't you come up too? Why don't you both come up? So Mary Josephson and Gregory have been in Portland. You've been here since, uh, how long have you been here? You've been here since? 70s. 70s. And they are two of the most popular artists in our community, doing fabulous work. Okay, we love their work. This is a piece by Mary, and this is a theme she started doing about two, three years ago. The that in the the um, middle about 2004. Mm -hmm. So it's been about 10 years now. I've been working with embroidery, 
It was another way to express myself other than the oil painting that I've been doing since I was about 15. Um, I, I was a military kid and my parents traveled all over the world and all over the United States, but they were New Yorkers and they believed in culture. So they took us on culture runs, all, no matter what city we lived in, Roswell, New Mexico, um, Kansas, uh, Newfoundland, they found a place that had museums or art and they took us there. So some of my fondest memories as a kid was just hanging out in the museums and trying to make sense of what there was going on there. And my favorite place that we lived was the San Joaquin Valley where people were harvesting fruit and people from all over the world came there because of the gold rush and the railroad. So all throughout my life, I thought I was going to see everywhere people from China, from, from Iran, from Mexico, South America, and all over Europe because that's the mix that there is there and always has been there. So I drew my, my first iconography from that representing people that were all different colors and it became a theme that was really important to me not judging a book by its cover like the color of people's skin but looking deeper into the spirit of the individual so um, that's that's how I, I approach my work and I came out here to Portland because my parents retired here um, I ended up here in 1978 and ended up going to PNCA and went to the Fountain Gallery selling tickets, raising money for, for the school. And then I um, met Gregory uh, through PNCA and um, ended up working at the Jameson Thomas Gallery after I graduated there. And um, so, and now showing at Laura Russo Gallery. So it, it, I stayed here after I graduated from college because this place allows you to make a place for yourself there. Portland gives you the room to grow and to become who, who you really are. And so that's, that's why I love Portland. That's why I stayed here. Wonderful. Gregory, why don't you go over by your work. Greg, Gregory's work is over here on the right. Oh, okay. And uh, his work is, uh, he paints on glass on the reverse. So he paints on the back. Yeah, I became an artist when I was 20. I decided that, or found out that you could paint anything you wanted to, to paint, and you, it could be art. And I was very discouraged painting on canvas. And one day, I uh, ran out of materials, and I started painting on old doors and windows that were in the back of my studio. And same thing happened. It just became mud until I sat down, looked at it, got up and turned it around, and it was just what I was thinking about. <laughs> the painting behind here looks like mud. But in the front, looks like the painting I was thinking of, or better. And from there, you know, that was in 1973, I, I continued, and my first art class was actually a, a lithography class. And that man who taught me, Theo Wujic, um, inspired me to be an artist, and I was a printmaker at first. Moved to Chicago from Detroit, Michigan, and worked at Landfall Press. And three years later, I moved here in 1976, and I uh, had my first one-person show at the Portland uh, uh, University, or the Portland, Portland State University Gallery. I had my first show, and I thought, this may be my last show, but I'm going to have a good time. And, uh, a friend at work helped me, and uh, he was my bartender, and, and I had that. And, you know, it was going to be next month that I, I will be celebrating 35 years of painting in Portland and having a one-person show. I'm going to have a show next month, but, but I, uh, I have to thank Jordan and Arlene for literally saving my life. Uh, Arlene drove me to a hospital with my legs squirting blood. Uh, See what a gallerist has to do? Okay. <laughs> she ran lights and nobody touched her. And, uh, but she also gave me a chance. She let me have a show. 
and that's all an artist needs, and um, I'll never forget that. And, uh, it's just really nice doing what you want to do, and that's that's what I think about art, and being able to do it. I've been able to support myself all these years doing that. So thank you for that. Wonderful. Yeah. Great. And then uh, and then Sherry, Sherry, you want to come on up a sec? I thought it'd be fun, and they're going to be having dinner with us, so if you want to talk to them some more or whatever. But uh, we love both of these artists, and Sherry Wolf we have in this room. We have two of them here, and there's, I think, one more out there. So uh, I wanted to ask you, why, uh, first, uh, how did you get to Portland, and why do you like being in Portland? Well, I was born in Portland. <laughs> so um, I think I, I benefited from the schools here. I was in public school, and I was always the class artist. I got to do a lot of murals in the wall, on the walls in the hallways while other people were doing more academic things. I did. Louder. Um, anyway, I'm from Portland, and um, when I was in high school, I uh, had a teacher who had gone to the Museum Art School, which is now PNCA, and I was her teacher's assistant. I was on the art staff. I took probably two or three art classes a year. I don't know how I got away with it, but I did. <laughs> And um, so she told me about the art school, and I didn't have a family that went to museums or knew anything about really um, the arts or colleges. And so I applied to the art school and went there, and it just opened this whole wonderful world of art. And the community um, was very based in the uh, art school in, uh, this was 1970. That seemed to be the nucleus for the arts, I would say, in Portland. So I had Louis Bunce, Mike Russo, George Johansson, Harry Widman, Eunice uh, Zen Jensen, um, and I, and I uh, as teachers. And then I also got introduced to Sally Haley and got to eat many great meals in her kitchen. And so it was wonderful. And I saw a very significant show through the school we went to San Francisco. I saw a very large Georgia O'Keeffe retrospective. And that just totally wowed me. Her painting, I loved painting and drawing. Who's that, Sherry? I didn't hear you. Georgia O'Keeffe okay. had a big retrospective in San Francisco. So that was great exposure for me to the outside world of museums beyond the museum here in Portland. So then when I graduated, I, I applied to go to art school in England. I wanted to get out of Dodge. You know, I was from Portland. I felt like I should be somewhere else. So I went there and um, studied printmaking, because George Johansson had been a wonderful inspiration to me. Um, so I had been involved in painting and printmaking. And um, when I finished a master's program there, I just I thought, well, I want to live somewhere where I'm going to have time to be an artist. And I just, you know, a lot of people thought, oh, you should go to New York. And I just thought, well, I know if I go to New York, I'm going to end up being a waitress. And it's not going to be a <laughs> So I came back here, and I got a teaching job fairly soon. And, and that was great. That's just what I needed. And I got to be in a show at Arlene's Gallery in 1978. So it really had a lot of opportunities, and I had a studio. I've never not had a studio since I've been out of school in 1975. So it's been just a great community. So I think it's uh, terrible. You know, if you ask an artist, tell me what's going on in some work, well, they, they shouldn't do that, because then that zaps my whole pitch that each of you, just like that young eight-year-old boy, each of you can look at any of these works and just, just react to it. You know, just feel it, think, ponder it, just let your mind go. But I can think it's reasonable to ask, where, the series you've had for a number of years where you've taken major famous paintings, the, I mean, if I'd been in art history, I'd know what their names were, but you've often done these famous Carvaccio and other kinds of painters, and then you do these amazing sort of flowers and fruit and other things in the foreground. I love the tension that you create in that juxtaposition of that work, but, but so where do you get your inspiration, though? Not what the meaning is, but where do you get your inspiration? Um, well, I rummage around in history. I, I find it really interesting. Um, I think it's a way of time travel to look at a great painting from the past. It takes me somewhere else and I can imagine 
you know, what the world looked like then. And they, they chronicled the world for us. And so when I saw, um, actually, Michelle Herson is a collector of American Hudson River School paintings, all the early paintings of America that were underappreciated, the museums weren't really collecting them, those paintings, and he started buying them when he was very young because they weren't very expensive, and now they're highly valued. So I saw all these great paintings of America, and I, I started thinking that would be really interesting to use them as a background and just imagine that I was there at that time. So the juxtaposition is pretty incongruous, but I, I never know where it's going to take me. And so I guess I'm just constantly exploring that. And artists have always borrowed from other artists. That's a strong tradition. And I, I very much enjoy rendering and um, uh, interpreting other works by other artists. So. But I, I don't think you ever know where it's going to take you. You just have to go with your intuition. And my teachers always said, you know, don't worry about being original. Just follow what you're really interested in, and it will take you somewhere. So. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Well, let's take a few questions if there are any, and then I'll finish up with them. Yes, sir. We have any, any questions? Yes. Right. We're up to 8,000 works, and um, I, I actually am an addict. I have these art needle marks, and uh, <laughs> unfortunately, rarely a week goes by that something doesn't happen. And, you know, I'm building this major public collection. I've never sold anything. It's going to be protected forever. And uh, as I've suggested, if we took a list of all the works on a wall, and you blindfolded me, and I threw a dart and it landed anywhere on that list, I'd feel like I was the luckiest person in the world to have just one of them. I'm fortunate that, that I'm able to accumulate more of them, but it's for this public collection so that curators and directors can come in, like building a public library, and, and draw from them for whatever theme they want to do. If it's a one-person show, if it's any kind of theme you can think about. Uh, so that's why getting the work out is so important to me. I have no sense of ownership, none. I mean, it's, I, I, when I look at this work that, yes, we, we own it, I don't sense any difference there about that than saying, gee, would I own that tree out there? I, I, no sense of ownership. And I don't carry any of this on any financial statements. We have to keep track of it for insurance purposes. Uh, but um, uh, there's just such joy from, uh, and I'll finish in a second, but with just loving art and having the passion about it, and then it just adds rocket fuel to share it with others. Uh, when I was called and asked if I had some work to bring out here, I was just thrilled. I was in charge at the Arlington Club of redoing the two floors there because we needed to do some seismic upgrading stuff. And when we finished it up a couple days before the club was opening the new two floors, uh, uh, the president then, Scott Langley, actually uh, said, oh, gosh, do we have any you know, contemporary art? I said, well, I've got a few pieces there. And I <laughs> put, put a bunch of art in, and I thought we'd have a a hue and cry from some of the members. We honored a lot of the older work the club had because I had arranged that all too. And my gosh, there was just one positive comment after another. So when I got a call uh, about putting some art here, I was thrilled because I thought, I mean, first, if you ask me, it's the right thing to do because this is presenting a new image, just the whole remodeling of the club here. And second, to honor the local artists and have that work up. Uh, this is work of our time and our community. Uh, and uh, it's been, been just great having so many people uh, come up and be complimentary. And there's a few more pieces I'd like to put up if I can get permission for that. So, <laughs> yeah. I, then, yeah. so any, any more questions? Just Wanda. How do you possibly choose what to hang in your own home and how often do you rotate it? The question was, what do we have in the home and how do we rotate it? Uh, first, I don't tend to rotate stuff out of the house because once I get it up, I love it so much. So unless a museum wants to borrow some pieces, I had two Andy Warhol sunset pieces in the entryway, and uh, there's a show right now, uh, this show actually in Living Color. They wanted those pieces, so we put, actually, we put these soup cans up. Um, uh, I, but I don't tend to rotate stuff, although there's a fair amount of stuff that goes out of the house on a year, every, year, every other year basis maybe and put new stuff up. 
And um, how did I pick the stuff for this house? I live out in Dunthorpe right now, although I'm moving back to Portland Heights at some point here. Um, and I sit down with Catherine Malone, my wonderful collections manager, been with us for 11 years, and we just sort of thought about the spaces. In my last house um, up on Hessler, we had about 75% uh, of the local art that I grew up with from the Fountain Gallery in the Northwest and 25% of the prints. This house I've got about 50-50. Uh, so it's a nice, nice balance. And I love the fact, uh, amidst the many things I'm so appreciative to my mother for, aside from being born and, you know, uh, she, 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 of all the fabulous things she did, she did not do a very good job teaching me how to golf. But, uh, no. <laughs> no. but uh, um, the, one, the one thing that I think she did um, um, help me with my eye is I think the local artists we have, okay, and there's the best of our local artists, two of, three of whom we have here, are just as good as anything anywhere. Now, it may not be they're as well known as Andy Warhol in the Modern Museum and whatever, but that doesn't mean in my look, uh, in my eye, I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm in my, uh, I mean, in my house, I've got uh, actually this, this Gregory Grennan, and I have right next to me a Lucinda Parker, and then a Mike Rousseau, and, uh, and yet outside I have, in the hallway, I've got Damien Hurst and Chuck Arnaldi, a California artist, and downstairs Frank Stella, and whatever. So I love the fact that for me, um, if the art speaks to me, then I I'm feel blessed to have it in my midst. Uh, yeah. So let me finish with this then. Um, uh, Liz Leach that has the, the gallery downtown who does such a wonderful job. She brings in a lot of great artists. Uh, she came to me about three years ago and she said that U.S. Bank had decided to open up some new high-end offices in their private banking group called Ascent and therefore the, the highest net worth folks in the private banking group. And I thought well, this was a, probably a pretty good strategy to differentiate because now every bank has a private banking group and they wanted to. And they wanted to, to put art in their offices and on some exhibitions and they hired Liz and she asked if she could borrow some work. Well, U.S. Bank is one of our lead banks and we're very appreciative of the relationship with them and I said, sure. So she started borrowing a bunch of art. And then they asked me to come to these openings, uh, like in San Francisco, there was a big Hockney show at the, at the De Young Museum, so we did a Hockney show at the U.S. Bank branch, or the U.S. Bank Ascent office. Point of this is, when I went and talked to those groups, both the wealth manager executives and the high net worth clients, you know, what I said to them was, for all of us that are fortunate, to maybe um, uh, uh, in that group to have a little bit more than we need. Uh, and I'm sure everyone in this room has spent time, some time figuring out in your estate what you're gonna do with your kids and what you're gonna leave them and how you're gonna leave it to them, okay? And I said, you know, as parents and uh, you know, uh, my daughters are 15 and 17, so most of you are a little bit ahead of me in this curve. As much as I want to insulate Audria, who's 15, and Ariel, who's 17, from all the issues that they've gone through and will be going through, you do your best, but you can't. In the end, they're going to go through the ups and downs, the heartaches, the boyfriends, the jobs, this, that, parent problems, all the issues that all of us have had, right? That all of our parents wished they could have waved a wand and not had us go through. Right, with Topher, I mean, I mean with, all right, okay. So what I said to all these folks, I said, for all the time you spend working on this estate planning and trying to figure out what to do with passing on to your kids and whatever, in the end, the greatest gift you can give them and to all of you to give your children and your grandchildren is a passion for the arts. It might be the visual arts, it might be dance, music, whatever. But if you give them a passion for the arts, then it's something that does two things. One with whatever problems they're going to go through in their life, it allows them to get away from those problems for just a moment. When they look at a painting or look at a sculpture or if they get into ballet or symphony or whatever art form it may be. And maybe in that moment they can refresh themselves and, and come back with a clear perspective about their life and their issues. And the second thing is, it's a gift that no one can take away from them. You don't need anyone. They can see art on a public street. They can go to a museum on a free day. 
Hopefully they may end up having some art in their midst, in their house or whatever. But that ultimately, if you think about the values you're trying to pass on to your kids, what greater gift than in terms of the, the right values and helping them be as healthy as they can be. And art is one way to help do that. So uh, thank you for letting me talk today. Thanks.